most embarrassed admits to one of the biggest embarrassments to, uh, to evolution. So according to Darwin's theory of natural selection, animals should evolve traits that are practical and efficient. Well, look at this thing. Uh, when a peacock sees a peahen in a particularly fancy uh, crossing the walking down the street, it automatically extends its tail and displays these, these beady eyes that look out of the audience. It almost looks like a work of art, not a work of practicality. But it turns out that many animals in the animal kingdom have these sorts of behaviors and structures that seem wholly impractical and even dangerous to predators. Imagine what it's like for this thing to walk down the street with its huge tail um, in, in extended. Um, it, it must be hard to walk, right? So, um, <laughs> why in the world do these structures exist? To help answer this question, Darwin had a brilliant insight. He realized that uh, we're on this earth not only to survive, but to reproduce. Now, I, I probably could have told him that myself. That, um, uh, that uh, and probably any, any one of you could probably realize, living life, that uh, we're not. That it is a struggle to, to reproduce sometimes. Um, but, uh, uh, or at least, uh, um, uh, whole meaning game is not easy, is all I'm going to say for most of us. Um, and it turns out that the theory of sexual selection well, has been neglected for nearly 100 years after Darwin first proposed it. Um, after he proposed it, it, it was not politically correct to think that the preferences of one sex in a species could basically determine the traits and behaviors and the evolution of, another, uh, of the other sex. So, but now in the last 30 years or so, sexual selection has come back into uh, prominence, and biologists, there's a general consensus that it, sexual selection plays an important role in the evolution of any species. Now, even though sexual selection exists, <laughs> it still remains a question as to why some of these things are attractive. Why is the big uh, peacock <coughs> feather attractive? Let's take the male mandrel, for instance. Here's another species. The male mandrel evolved very bright faces. It turns out the reason why they have these bright faces is because female mandrels dig them. Female mandrel chicks dig bright faces on these male mandrels. And it seems, and they, and they have kept this preference alive. So it's, it's natural to ask, why do female mandrels find this male mandrel hot? It's not, it's not an obvious question. <laughs> not an obvious answer, I think. So one of the first proponent, one of the first theories to explain this was uh, Sir Ronald Fisher who uh, proposed something called the runaway sexual selection model. According to this, this selection model, the preference just is. It exists. However, once it starts, it can't be stopped. To illustrate this point, let's take an example. Let's pretend that there's a population of males out there who have slightly bigger ears. And the females in that population find these ears attractive. So they mate with the males with the big ears. What happens is that they want their sons to have big ears. Right? This is why they mate with them. So those who don't have the preference for the big ears um, don't have sons who have big ears, and those who don't have the big ears don't get to mate. So eventually, after many generations, the ones without the big ears die off. And the ones without the preference for big ears also die off because they're not having sons who have big ears. Does that make sense? So this was his, uh, this was his basic idea of how runaway sexual selection works. So once the cycle starts, neither the male nor the female can break the cycle because both the big ear and the preference co-evolves until everyone has the trait. Now, there are some problems with a runaway account, which biologists have noticed. One is that everyone will eventually end up with big ears. So there will no longer be any variability in the population. If you think about it, this would be a problem. Imagine if everyone in our society looked like Brad, Brad Pitt or Glenn Deere, for, for that matter. Um, <laughs> this, this would be a problem because how would people choose who they want in a potential meet? It would be very difficult if everyone was attractive. So, um, it, <laughs> right? It would be difficult. So, according to the runaway selection model, after many ge generations of this selection, everyone in the society is going to have humongous ears. It's just going to run away. So, but so this is the problem. The second problem is why is there the intrinsic preference in the first place? What is so what is so hot about uh, this huge uh, tail or? Um, or uh, the bright face, or all these things that um, the species evolved. So, Sir Robert Fisher's answer to this question is that um, we have a certain perceptual bias. That's all it is, the perceptual bias. And those that have these displays are just capturing the attention of the females. And they're, so their direct, their attention is focused, 
And it's sort of like you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So those with the big ears are just attracting the most attention, and they're almost given a, they're the ones who are given the chance to display their, their wares. Well, it turns out that um, uh, biologists were not happy or satisfied with this account. I don't know, are you all satisfied with the perceptual bias accounts? Uh, it just doesn't seem, it just doesn't feel right. Um, and uh, mathematical models showed that it didn't work that well in computer simulations. So more recently, an Israeli biologist, Almolt Zahavi, developed something called the good genes theory of sexual selection. According to the good genes theory, female pre preferences are not arbitrary. In fact, they're quite discriminating. Females want to make sure that the 50% of the foreign genes that they're introducing into their offspring are the best that they can possibly get. So what they look for are things, are sexually selected traits that are good, reliable indicators of the health of the individual and are honest indicators. What I mean by honest is, um, has, has, has anyone here ever uh, had a chat-up line or a pickup line in a bar of some sort where um, the pickup line is, is uh, You've heard it before. You've heard it a million times before. It's not creative. It's not. It's, it's not. It's not a measure of, of anything, right? And, and you just roll your eyes at this person. You're like, Come on, don't even do this. So that's an indica indication of an unreliable indicator. This person's not showing they're they're honestly a good me, or they honestly have the uh, the intelligence. So so far, I've been speaking almost like um, females are the choosers and uh, males are the displayers. It turns out this is not the case in all animals, in all species. But it is the case that in most species, females are the choosers and the males are the displayers, quarters, because biologically speaking, females have more at stake in any single copulation than do males. Uh, women uh, can't have uh, many, many children at the same time. They have to bring a child to term, whereas the male, uh, biologically speaking, can sort of deposit his sperm and not return the phone call the next day. And, um, and this, well, this is the situation has, has created over many generations is a situation um, which, according to Daniel Nettle, the female should have evolved to be more guarded and the male more urgent. Now, so far I've been talking about other species, but let's talk about humans for a second. Because humans are, 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 are more, probably one of those complex animals. Jeffrey Miller has proposed that creative display, just like the peacock's tail, the peacock took something that all peacocks have, a tail, and exaggerated it. That that's what we do with creative display, in fact, is that um, it's a, the motivation for creative, creative display may have evolved through mechanisms of sexual selection. Um, it's not hard on the face of it to, to think that, um, to see how sexy creative display can be. There's a lot of sexual hysteria relating to rock stars, uh, writers, artists. It's obvious um, on the face of it. Celebrity obsession. Let's think about this for a second. Why are we such a celebrity obsessed culture? It doesn't seem to actually make analytical sense. Why would we glamorize movie stars, um, poets? Why do we glamorize Pablo Picasso more than the inventor of the sewer system who actually saved millions of lives and actually had very practical importance? People would even laugh, you know, the inventor of the sewer system, but that's actually a more practical thing. Why would we put on the pedestal things that don't have any survival value? Um, why uh, did the American Idol, American Idol is the number one program on TV, why did American Idol, the American Idol contestant, the, the winner of American Idol, gets a huge parade in their whole, you know, hometown, whereas, uh, for instance, someone who gets a PhD in psychology, grandma, mom and dad, um, so what's, what's, what's going on there? Okay. So Jeffrey Miller, <laughs> Jeffrey Miller has proposed that intelligence through creative display is an indicator of genetic fitness, just like I said the peacock's tail is an indicator. Um, it's not hard to find the many, uh, throughout history, many creative people who have had very high uh, reproductive success, success. Aphrodite, Jermaine Greal, Amos, Jimi Hendrix, Charlie Chaplin, Picasso, Ray Charles, any number of highly intelligent creative individuals have had considerable success in the main game, despite not having many idle appearances. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through a couple studies that give you a sampling of this theory. Of because up to this point I've basically just been talking about the theory, and you may be doubtful of the theory, and but uh, it's important in, in science to actually test these things and make testable predictions. So I'm going to review some some experiments, but uh, the other experiment there's a lot of experiments, 
Um, there's a whole book of uh, treatment of, uh, of experiments that we'll be selling afterwards, but I'm just going to give a snapshot. <laughs> That's in social psychology, we call that priming, by the way. <laughs> okay. So in this one study, um, it's a very interesting study, we'll get shifts in women's meat preferences across the menstrual cycle. So their reasoning was this. If creativity is an indicator of good genes, if that's really what's going on, um, then women who are in their higher fertility uh, stage of their ovulatory cycle should favor male creativity more so than male 